Welcome back to MGT4520 International Entrepreneurship and today we are looking at global marketing research and development. I hope you enjoy. The objectives in this session are to understand how increasing change in the telecommunications technology will affect the global entrepreneur and part of this is understanding the importance of and the role of innovation. By doing this, we're going to learn how to adapt the new product or service to the market it is entering. This will also lead to understanding and being able to use the product lifecycle and to understand how to plan and develop this process. Hopefully, we learn how to evaluate new products for sustainability to enter a new market, and part of this is to understand the global marketing mix and its key components. Entering global markets presents varying challenges, many of which are pivotal to the success of the international business venture. Let's look at these four topics here a little bit more in depth. Now, technological environment. This involves the technological landscape that varies significantly across different regions. Now, a major problem is the misalignment of a company's current technology with the infrastructure, digital literacy, and user preferences in the new market. Advanced technologies used by a company in its home market might not be viable in a market with limited technological development. Now, alternatively, entering a highly advanced technological environment may require substantial investment in innovation to meet high customer expectations and to give, compete with the local technologically advanced firms. Moving next to product policy and total quality issues. Now, product pro policies need to be adapted to suit different market standards and consumer expectations. Quality issues can arise when products designed for one market do not meet the regulatory requirements or the quality expectations of another. There's also the challenge of maintaining consistent product quality across various production sites, which may differ in terms of resources, processes, and quality control measures. Moving on to adopting the best research and development strategy, global markets require tailored research and development strategies to develop products that meet the localized needs and preferences of customers. Problems can arise when a company either fails to adapt its products to local markets or overextends its resources by trying to meet too many diverse needs. You're trying to do too much. Additionally, protecting intellectual property across different legal systems can be complex and costly. Lastly, developing and implementing the best marketing strategy. Now, crafting a marketing strategy that transcends cultural and linguistic barriers is a significant challenge. A one size fits all approach rarely works here. Businesses must navigate local advertising regulations, cultural nuances, and varied customer behavior patterns. Moreover, establishing brand recognition and trust can be considerably more difficult in markets where local competitors may already have a strong foothold. For businesses entering global markets, it's critical to conduct extensive market research, invest in local expertise, and be willing to adapt strategies as needed. Success in the global markets often requires a delicate balance between maintaining the core values and strengths of the brand while also being flexible and responsive to local market conditions. The technological environment is a critical component of global market entry, particularly in areas such as telecommunications, e-business, and product policy, including to total quality issues. Here's a detailed look at each of these bullet points. Telecommunications infrastructure is the backbone of modern global business. The availability, reliability, and advancement of telecommunication systems vary greatly from one country to another. A robust telecommunications network is essential for efficient operations, especially for real-time communication with customers, partners, and within the company. Challenges include varying standards and regulations the costs associated with accessing and using local networks, and the technological compatibility with global telecommunication networks. Moreover, in regions with underdeveloped telecommunications, businesses might struggle to implement advanced digital solutions that rely on high-speed internet or widespread mobile connectivity. E-business encompasses all aspects of running a business online and is heavily reliant on the technological environment of the target market. 
This includes not only the internet infrastructure, but also the digital savviness of the consumer base, the prevalence of e-commerce platforms, and the legal framework surrounding digital transactions. Entering a global market with an e-business strategy requires understanding local online purchasing behaviors, preferred payment methods, and the level of trust in online transactions. Data security laws and the need for digital privacy also plays a significant role as they may differ substantially across borders. Lastly, product policy and total quality issues. Now, product policy must take into account the technological expectations and requirements of the new market. This involves ensuring that products comply with local electronic standards, interoperability requirements, and consumer preferences for technological features. Total quality issues become even more pronounced in global settings where quality expectations can significantly vary. Companies must ensure that their products meet the highest quality standards, which may necessitate adjustments to the product design, features, or even the underlying technology. Furthermore, businesses must navigate the complexities of maintaining quality across diverse supply chains and production facilities, which often in the face of different quality control standards and practices. In all these areas, the key to success lies in the thorough market research, investment in local partnerships or expertise, and a flexible approach that allows for the adjustment of business models and strategies to fit the technological profiles of each unique market. The telecommunications landscape is rapidly evolving, particularly in rural emerging markets where access to mobile technology is expanding at an unprecedented rate. This growth is largely fueled by the proliferation of affordable mobile devices and the expanding reach of cellular networks, such as Elon Musk's Starlink, which uses satellites to deliver internet connections. Let's take a look at these four bullet points a little bit closer. So growing access to mobile technology in rural emerging markets. Mobile technology has become a key driver of economic growth and social change in rural emerging markets. As mobile coverage extends into these areas, residents are gaining unprecedented access to services that were previously out of reach because of geographical isolation. This includes access to banking, healthcare, education, and real-time information on markets and weather. The ubiquity of mobile phones is also enabling innovations such as mobile money, which allows users to conduct financial transactions without the need for traditional banking infrastructure. Let's take a look at cloud, mobile, and computer. Now, the integration of cloud computing with mobile technology is transforming business operations, even in remote areas. Cloud services offer scalable resources and data storage without the need for substantial on-premises infrastructure. When combined with mobile technology, businesses and individuals can access a wide array of applications and services from virtually anywhere. The increased use of computers, smartphones, and other devices in rural areas is enabling locals to participate in the global digital economy, which leverage e-learning opportunities and access government services online. Business transactions occurring in the most remote places on earth. With technological advancements, business transactions are no longer confined to urban areas. Farmers in remote areas can receive payments for their produce directly on their mobile phones. Artisans can sell their crafts online to customers across the globe. And small local businesses can source materials and services from international suppliers engaging in e-commerce on a level playing field with urban counterparts. The last point, attract greater foreign direct investment. The expansion of telecommunications infrastructure and the ensuing growth in digital literacy are making rural emerging markets increasingly attractive for foreign direct investment. Investors see the potential for new markets, the opportunity to tap into a growing consumer base, and the chance to outsource or establish operations in areas where technology now allows for seamless integration with the rest of the world. This investment can further accelerate the development of local economies, creating a virtuous cycle of growth and innovation, 
the, so uh, bringing this all together, the telecommunications revolution in rural emerging markets is not just bridging the digital divide, but also fostering economic development, innovation, and global integration. This makes these markets increasingly significant players in the global economy. E-business, otherwise known as electronic business, is revolutionizing commerce by enabling new ways of transacting and engaging with customers globally. Let's look at these five points a little bit more closely. Leapfrogging across the globe refers to the phenomenon where developing countries bypass less efficient and more expensive traditional infrastructure and move directly to more advanced technology. In the context of e-business, this means that instead of slowly evolving from physical retail, many regions are jumping straight into digital commerce. This jump is facilitated by the widespread adoption of mobile devices and cloud services, allowing even the most remote areas to participate in global e-commerce. Now, retailing re re involves e-business which has transformed retailing by allowing stores to operate online, significantly broadening their reach beyond physical locations. Consumers can shop from a vast array of products 24 seven, and retailers can collect valuable data on shopping habits to personalize the shopping experience. Inventory and supply chain management have also become more efficient with real-time tracking and automated restocking systems. Looking at financial services, now the financial services industry has been significantly impacted by the shift to e-business. Digital platforms now enable consumers to perform transactions, manage accounts, and access financial services without visiting a physical bank. Mobile banking, peer-to-peer -peer payment systems, and digital currencies are examples of financial technologies that have emerged from the e-business revolution. Looking at the fourth point, 24 hour buying and selling, the always on nature of e-business means that consumers can engage in buying and selling activities around the clock. This accessibility has changed consumer behavior with an expectation for on-demand services and fast, flexible delivery options. For businesses, this means an opportunity to maximize sales, but also the challenge of meeting these round the clock service expectations. Now, the fifth and final point here, rise of e-commerce in Africa. Africa is experiencing a significant surge in e-commerce. With a young and tech-savvy population, the continent has embraced mobile technology, which has become a catalyst for the e-commerce boom. The region is seeing the emergence of online marketplaces, fintech, which is financial technology startups, and digital platforms that cater to a growing middle class. This rise is drawing attention from global investors and multinational e-commerce companies looking to tap into the burgeoning market. The adoption of e-commerce in Africa is expected to drive economic growth, provide new opportunities for entrepreneurs, and increase access to goods and services for consumers. The growth of e-business across various sectors signifies a shift towards a more connected and digitally driven global economy. The key for businesses looking to succeed in this space is to understand local market dynamics, invest in the necessary technological infrastructure, and develop strategies that align with the global digital landscape. When entering global markets, companies must consider a spectrum of factors related to product adaptation, which can be complex because of the varied nature of markets around the world. Let's take a look at product adaptation for domestic products as well as characteristics of the international market. So product adaptation for domestic products and services for international markets often involves ensuring it meets the local legal requirements, which can include regulations covering safety, environmental impact, and compliance with local laws. Additionally, products must be culturally sensitive and align with religious and social norms to gain acceptance. Now, the logistics of providing parts and servicing for products can also be a challenge, particularly in markets where the infrastructure is less developed or significantly different from the home market. Companies must establish local supply chains or partner with local firms to ensure that products can be serviced and maintained 
effectively. Standardization, where feasible, can help amplify this process. By creating products that have universal features and require minimal adaptation, companies can enjoy economies of scale and easier entry into multiple markets. However, some level of customization is often inevitable to meet specific market needs. Packaging is another critical aspect of product adaptation. It must not only protect the product, but also adhere to local packaging laws, be appealing and informative to local consumers, and consider environmental regulations and consumer preferences regarding sustainability. Now, looking at characteristics of the international market, each international market has its characteristics that can necessitate product modifications. These may include changes in product features to suit different climates, tastes, or usage patterns. Government regulations and requirements are a major consideration. Products may need to be altered to comply with local regulations, which can be stricter or more lax than in the home market. This might affect product design, functionality, or even the materials used in production. Tariffs can significantly impact how products are priced and therefore their competitiveness in a new market. And in some cases, it may be necessary to substitute certain materials or components to lower the cost or comply with local content requirements. Finally, consumer behavior is a complex mix of attitudes, behaviors, beliefs, and traditions that can vary widely from one market to another. Understanding these nuances is essential to ensure that products meet the expectations and preferences of local consumers. This understanding can inform product features, marketing strategies, and even business models. Overall, product policy and addressing total quality issues in the context of global markets are about balancing the need for adaptation with the desire to maintain a consistent brand identity and quality standard. It requires a deep understanding of local markets and a flexible approach to product development and marketing. Training global managers is a complex task that requires an understanding of various management philosophies and their implications for international business. Here's a detailed look at three core philosophies, ethnocentric philosophy, geocentric philosophy, and polycentric philosophy. Now, an ethnocentric approach to management prioritizes home country nationals over local or third country nationals for key international positions. The rationale behind this philosophy is that individuals from the home country are perceived to better understand and represent the company's values, strategies, and practices. Training for these managers often focuses on ensuring they can apply the home country's management style and corporate culture abroad. However, this approach can lead to a lack of sensitivity towards the local culture, potentially causing disconnects between the company and its local stakeholders. It can also inhibit the company's ability to fully leverage local expertise and insights. Geocentric philosophy adopts a more global perspective, recognizing the importance of integrating diverse regions and cultures through a unified approach to decision making. Training under a geocentric philosophy involves preparing managers to operate within multiple cultural contexts, emphasizing cross-cultural communication, adaptability, and international collaboration. Managers are selected based on their skills and suitability for the role rather than their nationality. The aim is to develop leaders who can transcend cultural boundaries and work towards the company's global objectives which fosters a strong sense of a global corporate culture. Polycentric philosophy places high value on local knowledge and expertise, favoring host country nationals for managing local operations. This philosophy is grounded in the belief that local managers are best equipped to understand and navigate the market dynamics and cultural nuances of their own region. Training programs for global managers within a polycentric framework would focus on local business practices, legal requirements, and market preferences. It can also help multinational corporations to minimize cultural clashes and resistance from the local workforce. However, it may create challenges in maintaining a cohesive corporate culture and aligning the diverse international operations with the company's overall strategy. 
In preparing global managers, it's crucial to balance these philosophies with the strategic needs of the business, the nature of the local market, and the overarching goals of the organization. This involves a combination of international business training, cultural immersion, language instruction, and leadership development tailored to the company's chosen management philosophy. International leadership requires a nuanced approach that considers the diverse cultural, economic, and legal landscapes of various countries. Each leadership style has implications for how leaders are perceived and how effectively they can manage and motivate their teams. In this slide, we discuss authoritarian, paternalistic, and participative types of leadership. Now, authoritarian leaders in an international context maintain a strong focus on tasks and organizational goals. They typically make decisions without seeking input from subordinates and expect compliance and obedience. This style may be effective in high power distance cultures where there is a strong respect for authority and less emphasis on individual autonomy in the workplace. However, it can be a challenging approach to leadership in cultures that value independence and participation, potentially leading to employee dissatisfaction and low morale. Certain industries such as health, firefighting, policing, are more suited for authoritarian style of leadership and decision making. Paternalistic leadership blends a directive approach with a family-like responsibility for the well-being of employees. Leaders adopting this style take a personal interest in the needs of their employees, much like a parent, and expect loyalty and respect in return. This style can be particularly effective in cultures that value social harmony, community, and familial structures within the business environment. Now, it does strike a balance between organizational objectives and employee welfare, which potentially leads to a loyal and committed workforce. However, it may be less effective in individualistic cultures where such an approach might be viewed as intrusive or patronizing. Now, participative leadership also known as democratic leadership, is characterized by a dual focus of achieving work goals and supporting team members. Leaders encourage team involvement in decision-making processes, fostering a sense of ownership and empowerment among employees. This approach aligns well with egalitarian cultures that value collaboration and employee input. Participative leaders can facilitate innovation and creativity by leveraging diverse perspectives within international teams. However, it may be less effective in urgent decision-making scenarios such as policing or ambulatory care or in cultures where such participative processes are not the norm. In international settings, the most effective leaders are often those who can adapt their style to the local context and who possess a deep understanding of the cultural dynamics at play. They are culturally intelligent, able to navigate different cultural expectations, and can integrate various leadership philosophies to inspire and manage their teams effectively across borders. Cultural clusters refer to groups of countries that share similar cultural characteristics. Understanding these clusters is essential for two key areas of international business and leadership, understanding your potential market and understanding the people you need to lead. So understanding your potential market, markets are heavily influenced by the cultural norms and values that prevail within them. These norms and values affect consumer behavior, decision-making processes, and attitudes towards products and services. For instance, in a culture that values collectivism, products and marketing strategies that emphasize community and family may be more effective than those that focus on individual achievement. When entering a market, businesses must consider the following such as communication styles. How direct or indirect should marketing messages be? Some cultures prefer straightforward communication while others rely on context and subtlety. How about negotiating practices? What are the local customs around negotiation? Some cultural clusters may prioritize relationship building before any business transaction, while others may focus on quick, efficient deal-making. There's also consumer preferences. 
Are there specific tastes or preferences that are common in the cluster? This can range from product features and design to the method of service delivery. We also have regulatory environment. What are the legal and ethical standards governing business practices within the cluster? These can have profound implications for product adaptation and business strategy. How about understanding the people you need to lead? When leading a team from a different cultural cluster, it's crucial to be aware of the leadership styles and organizational dynamics that are most effective. Considerations should include motivation, such as what drives the team members. Is it collective success, personal achievement, security, or recognition? Authority and hierarchy. How are power and decision-making distributed? Is there an expectation for a top-down approach? or is a more egalitarian structure preferred? Conflict resolution. How do team members handle disagreements? In some cultures, open confrontation may be avoided in favor of harmony and indirect negotiation. There's also team dynamics. Are teams driven by individual accountability or do they thrive on collaboration and group cohesion? Leaders must adapt their management style to align with the cultural expectations and practices of their team members. This can mean adjusting communication styles, decision-making processes, and even the way praise and criticism are delivered. There's also cultural intelligence. Both market understanding and leadership require cultural intelligence, also known as CQ, which is the capability to relate and work effectively across cultures. High cultural intelligence leaders and businesses can discern and adapt to the cultural context of different clusters, which enables them to operate effectively and sensitively in a global environment. This involves ongoing learning, self-awareness, and the ability to empathize with people from various cultural backgrounds. So bringing this all together, cultural clusters provide a framework for anticipating and responding to the nuances of global markets and international teams. By tailoring approaches to align with these cultural characteristics, businesses and leaders can foster better engagement, enhance performance, and achieve success in the global arena. Now, Table 9.1 in your textbook discusses cultural clusters classified on societal cultural practices where cultural dimensions such as performance orientation, assertiveness, future orientation, and humane orientation are discussed more in depth as it has a relationship to specific countries. Adopting the best research and development strategy is pivotal for fostering innovation and maintaining competitive advantage. This strategy should be aligned with the company's goals and market needs, encompassing different types of innovation, such as the four mentioned on this slide. Creating changing something to make new. This is the essence of innovation, which lies in creating or improving products, services, or processes to deliver better value. An effective R&D strategy should encourage a culture of creativity and experimentation. This involves investing in new ideas, providing resources for experimentation, and accepting the risk of failure as a part of the innovation process. The second point, breakthrough innovation, are those that significantly alter the dynamics of the industry, often creating new markets or revolutionizing existing ones. Research and development strategies focused on breakthrough innovation prioritize long-term research and significant investment in technologies with the potential to disrupt the status quo. These strategies often involve higher risks, but the rewards can be substantial, establishing the company as a market leader. Technological innovations involve the development or application of new technologies to improve products or, or processes. A research and development strategy that emphasizes technological innovation should be closely aligned with the latest scientific and technological advances. It requires ongoing investment in tech-focused research and demand resources, such as skilled personnel, advanced labs, and collaboration with research institution. 
Lastly, ordinary innovations may not be as groundbreaking as technological or breakthrough innovations, but they are crucial for incremental improvements that can lead to significant enhancements in efficiency, cost reduction, and customer satisfaction. Research and Development Strategies, or R&D, for ordinary innovation focuses on continuous improvement, often involving feedback loops with customers and frontline employees who understand the practical challenges and opportunities for enhancement in products and services. For a successful R&D strategy, it is critical to have a balanced portfolio of innovation projects that include a mix of long-term, high-risk projects and short-term, low-risk projects. It should also involve a clear process for moving ideas from conception to commercialization, including stages of development, testing, feedback, and iteration. Moreover, the strategy should be flexible to adapt to changes in the market and technological landscape. It should foster a culture that is not only technologically advanced, but also customer centric, ensuring that innovations are relevant and valuable to the market. Now, lastly, collaboration both within the organization and with external partners can provide access to a wide range of expertise and insights, which is often necessary for driving innovation in complex and competitive environments. From a consumer's perspective, innovation is often synonymous with improvement, newness, and the enhancement of life or work. Now here's how consumers might view continuous and discontinuous innovation. Continuous innovation refers to the incremental changes that are made to existing products, services, or processes. For consumers, these innovations can signify consistent improvement and refinement, which can enhance the user experience without drastically altering the way that the product is used. For instance, yearly updates to smartphones with better cameras or batteries are seen as valuable enhancements that don't require consumers to learn new behaviors or adapt to completely new interfaces. Consumers often expect and appreciate continuous innovation as it shows a company's commitment to product development and customer satisfaction. However, it's important that these changes are meaningful and not just perceived as superficial or redundant, which can also lead to dissatisfaction or indifference. Now, discontinuous innovation, on the other hand, represents a significant departure from existing practices and often introduces a new paradigm. This can be more exciting and transformative for consumers, offering them novel solutions that may significantly change their behaviors, improve efficiency, or open up new possibilities. An example is the shift from feature phones to smartphones, which introduced a completely new way of interacting with mobile devices and accessing the internet. While discontinuous innovation can be revolutionary, it also comes with a set of challenges from a consumer's point of view. There can be a steeper learning curve and an initial resistance to adopting new technologies or methods. These innovations can also lead to disruptions in the consumer's routine or require a reevaluation of existing products, which can be met with resistance unless the value proposition is clear and compelling. For businesses, understanding the consumer's viewpoint on innovation is crucial. Continuous innovation may be less risky and easier to market to existing customers, but it sometimes leads to market saturation. Discontinuous innovation, while riskier and requiring more effort in consumer education and marketing, can break through a crowded marketplace and establish a brand as a leader in innovation. Ultimately, consumers value innovations that tangibly improve their lives, offer new experiences, or solve problems in a way that previous products did not. Companies that can effectively communicate the benefits of these innovations and help consumers navigate the transition will be better positioned to succeed. From a firm's perspective, the development of new products and the expansion into new markets are both integral components of growth and competitive strategy. Now for new products, for a firm, New products are often a response to evolving consumer needs, technological advancements, or a strategy to gain a competitive ed edge. From ideation to development and launch, new product creation is a multifaceted process involving market research, research and development, prototyping, testing, and marketing. 
The development of new products can open up additional revenue streams, revitalize the brand, and keep the company relevant in a competitive landscape. The introduction of new products also comes with challenges and risks, including R&D expenditures, the possibility of market rejection, and the need for effective marketing. Firms must carefully assess the potential return on investment, market demand, and their capability to produce and support the new product. Moreover, they need to protect intellectual property associated with new products, which can be a critical issue, especially in global markets with varying IP enforcement standards. Now, new markets, entering new markets allows firms to diversify their revenue sources and reduce dependence on their original markets. It can be driven by market saturation at home, opportunities for growth abroad, or the need to spread operational risk. This expansion can take many forms, such as exporting, franchising, forming joint ventures, or setting up subsidiaries. However, new markets also pose challenges such as understanding different consumer behaviors, legal and regulatory compliance, political risk, and cultural nuances. Firms must adapt their business strategies to accommodate these differences, which may involve altering product offerings, adjusting marketing strategies, and establishing new supply chains. Both new product development and market expansion require a firm to be adaptive, innovative, and strategic. Success in these endeavors depends on a firm's ability to leverage its strengths, understand and respond to market signals, and execute with precision. Firms often use portfolio management techniques to balance the risks and returns associated with new product development and new market entry strategies. This ensures that resources are allocated efficiently and that the firm's overall risk profile is managed effectively. Opportunity analysis is a critical process for entrepreneurs and businesses seeking to launch new ventures or expand existing ones. It consists of recognizing potential opportunities and then systematically assessing their viability. Opportunity recognition is about identifying a gap in the market that can be filled by a new product or service. It's the initial spark where an individual or team sees the potential to meet a need that is not currently being addressed effectively. This reg recognition often stems from a combination of factors, existing knowledge, experience, education, deep domain expertise or experience in a particular industry can reveal inefficiencies or unmet needs that others might overlook. Networking, Engaging with a wide network of contacts can provide insights into problems that require solutions, often leading to the identification of new business opportunities. Opportunity assessment plan. Once an opportunity is recognized, it needs to be rigorously evaluated. This involves several key steps. The first being description of the idea and its competition. To do so, you need to clearly articulate what the product or service is and how it addresses the identified need. Then you need to analyze the competitive landscape to understand where your offering stands relative to existing solutions. This includes direct and indirect competitors. The second step, assessment of the domestic and international market for the idea, you first need to research the size of the market, the growth potential, customer demographics, and buying patterns. Next, you need to, for international markets, consider cultural, economic, and regulatory differences that could affect the success of the product or service. The third step, assessment of the entrepreneur and the team. First, you need to evaluate the second, or sorry, you need to evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of the entrepreneur and their team. Consider whether they have the necessary skills, experience, and resilience to bring the idea to market. The next step is to determine if the team has a balanced mix of technical skills, business acumen, and industry knowledge. Fourth part, discussion of the steps needed to make the idea the basis for a viable business venture. You first need to develop a step-by-step -step plan outlining 
what needs to be done to turn the idea into a successful business. This includes product development, market testing, securing funding, creating a business model, and scaling the business. The next step here is to assess financial projections, resource requirements, potential risks, and mitigation strategies. The objective of the Opportunity Assessment Plan is to provide a roadmap that evaluates the feasibility of the idea and outlines a clear strategy for its execution. It requires a combination of market research, strategic planning, and an honest appraisal of the capabilities of the team and the business environment. Engaging with advisors or consultants with seeking counsel can also provide valuable external perspectives and expertise to enhance this assessment. Ultimately, a thorough opportunity analysis helps entrepreneurs and businesses to avoid costly mistakes and to focus their resources on the most promising opportunities. It is a foundational element of successful business planning and strategy execution. The product life cycle encompasses several stages from the initial conception of a product to its withdrawal from the market. The stages listed here are part of the early phases of the life cycle, focusing on planning and development of a new product. Here's a little bit more information about each of these stages. In terms of idea, the product life cycle begins with an idea. This is often the result of identifying a market need, technological innovation, or creative insight. Ideas can come from various sources, including employees, market research, customers, competitors, or changes in technology and society. The second stage, concept. Now a concept is a more refined version of the idea. It includes a preliminary definition of the product, its potential market, and the benefits it offers. The concept phase often involves feasibility studies and initial market research to validate the idea and refine the product's proposed features and benefits. The third stage, product development. During product development, the concept is transformed into a tangible product. This stage involves detailed design and engineering, prototype creation and testing. The development phase is resource intensive, requiring investment in research and development materials and labor. It also includes multiple iterations to refine the product based on feedback and testing results. Number four, testing marketing. Before a full market launch, a product often undergoes test marketing, where it is introduced to a limited market segment to gather real world data on its performance. Test marketing can reveal consumer responses to the product, its pricing, distribution channels, and promotional strategies. This stage helps in making final adjustments before a broader rollout. Now, following these stages, the product enters the full-scale market launch phase, where it becomes available to the wider public. The subsequent stages of the product life cycle then include market introduction, now the product is launched through various channels and the focus is on increasing awareness and adoption. Sales growth tends to be slow at this stage as the market is just learning about the product. The sixth stage then transitions into growth. If the product meets a genuine need and is well received, it enters the growth stage where sales and profits start to increase rapidly. The firm may start to invest more in marketing and may expand distribution during this stage. At some point we hit maturity. Eventually sales growth slows as the market becomes saturated. The product has been adopted by most of the target market and competition is typically intense. Companies may modify the product, adjust pricing or improve features to extend the maturity phase. Eventually this will lead to decline. As consumers interest wanes, technology advances or new products enter the market, the product may enter the decline phase. Sales and profits decrease and companies must decide whether to rejuvenate the product, withdraw it, or replace it with a new offering. Now throughout the product life cycle, the company must continually assess the product's performance, market conditions, and competitive landscape, adjusting its strategies to maximize the product's success and profitability.
The idea stage is critical in the product development process as it sets the foundation for creating a product that resonates with customers. This stage involves a deep understanding of the target audience's needs, wants, and desires. Needs are the fundamental requirements that customers have, which are essential for their survival or basic functioning. At the idea stage, it is important to identify these needs through market research, surveys, and observation. The product idea that aims to fulfill a need must address a problem that is significant and common am among the target audience. For example, a need could be food, shelter, safety, or convenience in daily tasks. When developing an idea based on needs, the focus should be on creating a solution that is both effective and accessible. This could mean innovating to improve upon existing solutions or finding new ways to meet these needs more efficiently. The goal is to provide a product that becomes a necessity for the consumer, ensuring steady demand and a strong market presence. Wants are the desires that go beyond the basic needs and are shaped by cultural and social factors. They are what consumers would like to have to improve their quality of life. Wants are often identified by exploring consumer aspirations, lifestyle preferences, and trends. In the idea stage, aligning a product with consumer wants can create a compelling value proposition that resonates emotionally with potential customers. This requires creativity and an understanding of the nuances that drive consumer behavior. For instance, a smartphone may meet a basic need for communication, but consumers might want a smartphone with a high quality camera or a sleek design. Desires are deeper and more specific than wants. They are shaped by individual personalities and experiences. They are often aspirational and can be associated with luxury, status, or personal fulfillment. During the idea stage, tapping into consumer desires can lead to the creation of a product that carries a strong personal appeal and can command a premium in the market. This involves a nuanced approach, including market segmentation and targeting, to align the product idea with the unique motivations that influence customer purchases. By addressing desires, a company can foster a strong brand loyalty and create advocates for its products. Integrating needs, wants, and desires, a successful product idea often integrates these three components to deliver a compelling proposition to the consumer. It begins with a need, enhances it with the wants, and differentiates it by creating the desires. For example, an electric car may meet the need for transportation, need, do so in an environmentally way, want, and provide a cutting edge technology experience, which is a desire. At the idea stage, the focus should be on first, thoroughly researching the market to understand the consumer's psychological and physical requirements, Second, identifying gaps in the current offerings where the product could make a difference. Third, ensuring that the idea is feasible and can be developed in a, into a product that meets these criteria. By satisfying needs, wants, and desires, a product idea has a better chance of success when it moves into the concept and development phases. It is also important to continuously validate these assumptions through consumer feedback as the product moves through its life cycle. At the concept stage of product development, the focus shifts from a broad idea to a more concrete proposition. It is at this stage that the specifics of the product are defined, taking into consideration how it will stand out in the market. Features, price, and promotion are three crucial elements that are developed during this phase. Features of a product are its characteristics that are designed to deliver specific benefits to the user. They are developed based on the identified needs, wants, and desires of the target market. During the concept stage, decisions are made about the core functionalities, design, technology, materials, and any unique selling propositions that the product will have. Detailed specifications are outlined, which serve as a blueprint for the subsequent product development phase. Now, the features must align with the overall brand strategy and be feasible within the constraints of manufacturing and budget. 
Pricing strategy is a critical aspect of the concept stage because it affects how the product is positioned in the market and the segment of consumers it targets. Pricing must consider the cost of production, the perceived value of the product to the consumer, competitor pricing, and overall market trends. It must also align with the marketing and branding strategy. For example, a premium pricing strategy could reflect a high-end luxury brand image. Pricing models need to be developed, considering whether the product will be sold as a one-time purchase on a subscription base or through a freemium model. Promotion involves deciding how the product will be communicated to the target market. The promotional strategy at the concept stage sets the stage for how marketing and advertising will be conducted. The promotional plan outlines the key messages, the channels that will be used, such as social media, print advertising, online marketing, and the tactics for reaching the target audience. It involves establishing branding elements like logos, taglines, and the overall brand story that will be associated with the product. The concept stage may also include planning for the product launch, promotional, promotional events, public relations strategies, and sales promotions. The concept stage is where theoretical ideas start to take on practical dimensions. Market research is often used extensively during this phase to test and refine the product concept. This ensures that the features, price, and promotion are not only aligned with the company's capabilities and goals, but also the market's expectations and demands. It's a critical point where adjustments can be made before significant resources are invested in development and marketing. Implementing the best marketing strategy requires making informed pricing decisions that reflect the company's broader strategic goals. Let's break down some of these pricing strategies. When pricing for foreign markets, a company must consider several factors to ensure its products are competitively priced and still profitable. One of the factors is costs. This includes the production costs, shipping, tariffs, and any additional costs associated with marketing and selling in a foreign market. Another factor is competitive prices. The company must research what competitors are charging in the foreign market to ensure their prices are competitive. Another factor includes customer price sensitivity and behavior, where understanding how price changes affect demand in the foreign market is critical. This requires analyzing customer behavior and sensitivity to price changes. Market structure and conditions is another factor where the company must understand the market dynamics, including the level of competition, the presence of substitutes, and the bargaining power of buyers and sellers. Now, objectives of the company is the pricing strategy should align with the company's objectives, whether that's market penetration, profit maximization, or simply covering costs while establishing a market presence. Let's move now to pricing strategies. So cost plus pricing is a strategy that involves adding a margin above the total cost to ensure profitability. It's a straightforward approach, but must consider the competitiveness of the market. Marginal cost takes into account only the direct costs associated with producing and selling for export. It can be used to set prices that cover these costs while remaining competitive. Market differentiated pricing is a strategy that sets pricing according to what the market can bear, considering the competitive landscape and may vary by region or customer segment. Transfer pricing is particularly relevant for companies that operate in multiple countries and need to set prices for transactions between their own subsidiaries. So looking at alternative pricing strategy, we have arm's length pricing. And this is the price is set as if the two parties were unrelated, ensuring transactions are conducted as they would be between independent entities. This method is often required by tax authorities to prevent profit shifting. Number two, transfer at the price of direct cost. Now, the transaction is priced based only on the direct cost, not including any markup. This might be used for strategic reasons, such as supporting a new subsidiary. The third is transfer at the price of direct cost plus any additional expenses. Now this covers the direct cost plus additional expenses related to the transaction. This ensures the exporting entity covers its cost and perhaps a small profit. 
Fourth, transfer at a price derived from the end market price. So in this situation, the transfer price is based on the final market price minus expected profit margins and any costs that occur after the transfer, like marketing expenses. Effective pricing strategies in, in its collective sense require a deep understanding of both the home and foreign markets in which a company operates. Decisions should be backed by thorough research and analysis considering legal and tax implications, especially for transfer pricing. The chosen strategies must align with the overall marketing strategy, which includes product positioning, promotion, and distribution channels to create a cohesive approach that drives market success. The distribution strategy of a company is a key component of its overall marketing strategy, involving decisions about how to deliver products or services to the consumer. Let's explore in detail the elements mentioned regarding establishing and managing distribution channels. So establishing the channel length and width, the first being length of the channel. So long channels, these involve several intermediaries between the producer and the consumer, such as distributors, wholesalers, and retailers. Long channels are often used for products that require a broad distribution network, such as consumer goods. The advantage is extensive market coverage, but the downside can be less control over the product and potentially low profit margins because of the number of intermediaries, each taking a share of the profits. Now, short channels typically involve fewer intermediaries. For instance, a manufacturer might sell directly to the retailer or even directly to consumers. Short channels provide more control to the manufacturer and often result in higher margins, but they require more investment in managing relationships and logistics. Now, the width of the channel, first being narrow, a narrow distribution channel means the product is offered by a small number of intermediaries. This is often the case with specialty or luxury products, where the focus is on maintaining a certain level of prestige or exclusivity. Now, a wide distribution channel means the product is available through most intermediaries at each level. This approach is common for mass market products where wide availability is crucial for competitive advantage. Now, when it comes to selecting and managing a channel, so the selection of intermediaries first, you know, choosing the right intermedi intermediaries is critical because they must be aligned with the company's brand image market positioning, and customer service standards. Now, secondly, reliable sources are needed to identify potential intermediaries, including industry databases like Dun & Bradstreet, telephone directories, and trade directories from the Department of Commerce or similar institutions. Now, the screening perspective companies, first, we want to you know, develop a thorough screening, which is vital to ensure that intermediaries are financially stable, have a good market reputation, and are capable of providing the level of sales and support required. Secondly, this process may involve credit checks, references from other manufacturers, and an evaluation of their marketing and distribution capabilities. The third component, managing the channel. First, managing the channel involves continuous collaboration with intermediaries, ensuring that they are motivated and equipped to sell the product effectively. Secondly, it includes training intermediaries about the product, setting up incentive programs, establishing clear communication channels, and providing marketing support. With the fourth part being evaluating channel performance, which requires regularly assessing the performance of distribution channels, which helps in making necessary adjustments. Performance metrics might include sales volume, market coverage, customer feedback, and the speed of distribution. Now, the resource that I mentioned here, CEOpedia.org, typically provides insights into channel management strategies. Businesses often refer to such resources for in-depth information on various distribution models and best practices. A well-designed distribution strategy maximizes efficiency and customer satisfaction, which ensures that products are available where and when customers want them, in the desired quantity and at an acceptable cost. This requires careful planning and ongoing management to adapt to change in the market or in consumer behavior. In essence, establishing and managing distribution channels are about making strategic decisions that align with the company's overall business objectives while ensuring the best possible customer experience. 
It's a dynamic process that requires attention to both the macro level strategy of channel design and the micro level details of partner management. Lastly, promotion decisions are crucial for communicating the value of a product or service to customers. They encompass a range of activities that inform, persuade, and remind potential buyers about the business and its offerings. Let's take a look at some of these points here on the slide. Advertising involves paying to communicate a message to a large audience, typically through mediums such as television, radio, print, online, and outdoor advertising. Effective advertising could and should capture the attention of the target audience, communicate clear information about the benefits and unique selling points of the product or service, create memorable messages that reinforce brand recognition and encourage purchasing decisions. Publicity involves generating media coverage for the business or its products without direct payment. This can include press releases, news articles, interviews, and other forms of media engagement. The key benefits of publicity are often perceived as more credible than advertising because it comes from third party sources, can quickly build awareness and enhance the brand's reputation, typically has no direct cost, but it's less controllable than advertising. Now, personal selling is a face-to-face -face selling technique where a salesperson interacts directly with a customer to persuade them to make a purchase. It is particularly effective because it allows for personalized communication tailored to the individual customer's needs. The salesperson can immediately address any questions or concerns the customer may have. It can be very effective in building long-term customer relationships and is essential for complex, high-value or business-to-business -business sales. Sales promotion are short-term incentives designed to stimulate quicker or greater purchases of particular products or services by consumers or the trade, which can include discounts, coupons, or cashback offers, contests, contest sweepstakes and giveaways, point of purchase displays and demonstrations. Now, social media platforms are increasingly crucial for promotion due to their vast reach and the ability to engage with customers directly. Social media promotion can provide a platform for engaging content that can go viral, significantly increasing message reach. It can also allow for targeted advertising based on detailed demographic and behavioral data, as well as foster two-way communication between the brand and the consumer, building relationships and community. In crafting a promotion, promotional strategy, businesses must decide on the right mix of these tools based on their target audience, marketing goals, budget, and the nature of their product or service. It's also essential to integrate all promotional activities to ensure a consistent message across all channels. This integration is known as Integrated Marketing Communications, or IMC, ensuring that all forms of promotions are carefully linked together to create a seamless consumer experience. That was certainly one of the longer episodes that we have in this series. And thank you for tuning in. Be sure to like, subscribe, hit that bell, and stay tuned for more content coming your way. Take care. Have a great day.